So for this episode of Idea Channel, we're going to be talking about cyborgs, what a cyborg is, what it means that we have cyborgs, and kind of why we're interested in them as a construct. And to do that, we're going to talk with uh, my good friend, Rose Eveleth. Um, so Rose, we know one another. We met several years ago at TED. So we were there for their like education program. Yes, TED rad. Education. I used to work there to do like scripting and animation and stuff like that. And so what and what can you tell everybody what it is that you do now? I'm the host of a podcast called Flash Forward, which is about the future, and I also write about technology, science, and then how the human body and technology kind of come together in these weird ways. You have a column for Motherboard. Motherboard. Yes, about design bias. So basically all the ways in which Bias, whether that's sexism, racism, you know, LGBT issues, all that stuff is coded into science and technology, not necessarily nefariously, but just because it exists in the world and it winds up in our science. And people think that science and tech are like pure and don't have any sort of biases, but that's not true. Sure, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I was really interested to talk to you about the idea of cyborgs, because you think and write a lot about the collision of technology and humanity. Yes. Um, and what a future where that collision is both more complete um, and more constant would look like. Has that collision become so commonplace that we could say that we are cyborgs? Like, are you a cyborg? I have an RFID chip in my hand. I was gonna say, I don't want, I didn't want to put you on yeah. the spot, but I know that you have a weird... I figured yeah. we'd get to it. <laughs> yeah, I do have an RFID chip in my hand, so um, the first thing people ask is like, are you being tracked? No, it can't communicate with satellites. It's not that powerful. It's just a little glass bead. I don't know if you can see it, um, but you can probably yeah. see it like that right there. Yeah. Um, and it's just like hard. It basically is like a little pill. So what stuff. what do you use it? Do you so use it or do you just? There are people who do use them much more like in their lives. So uh, Emil Grostra, who's the one who did this, he's the founder of something called Dangerous Things, which is where you can buy this kind of stuff online. Um, and he unlocks his house with his hand. He has actually one in both hands, so he can like, you know, do sure. both. Um, he unlocks his car with it. He's got tons of applications. A lot of people use them. A lot of grinders use them for their lab spaces where they kind of like walk in and they swipe their hand. Um, and most people don't notice sometimes when Emil does it because he's just like, it's so natural to him. He just kind of like walks in and then people will be like, wait a minute. I mean, and that really do? does the like, it's like very magical yeah, at that point where you're is. just doing these inscrutable hands. It motions. does make you feel like a magician when you can be like, oh yes, unlocked. <laughs> it's great. So I think that this sort of gets to the heart of one of the things that I'm really interested in, which is that when you think, when when we think about cyborgs, when people talk about cyborgs, there's a really specific thing I think that comes to mind, and it's this like, you know, it's Terminator, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, living living skin over metal exoskeleton, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. It's computers inside of human yeah. meat, but the term itself, when it was at least first used, it, yeah. it meant something much different or more broad? More broad, I think. So in the 1960s, two MIT professors were thinking about, okay, humans are gonna go to space and we need to figure out how to go to space safely. And we didn't really know like what the impacts of space were gonna be on oh, wow. humans, right? Okay. Uh, and actually we still kind of don't know. <laughs> but, so they were thinking like, okay, what are the ways that we can kind of take this like meat cage that we're in and make sure that it is safe and be able to function in space? So they coined the term cyborg which basically they, they said things like this is something where you incorporate exogenous components, which is outside stuff, yeah. to the body that makes it adapt, that it can extend self-regulatory control, which means like, so that way you're in charge of it, right? You're not, it's not like you're using a machine that's outside of you. The machine is in you, you're self-regulating the machine and that it's helping you adapt to new environments. So basically they were saying like, can we build a cyborg that is a human that has sort of other components in it. And they don't necessarily specify machine components. They're open to other things too. Maybe it's like algae in the skin. Maybe it's like other stuff. So like the question is like, how do you make sure that the spaceship and whatever like is around them knows what the astronaut needs without them having to like push buttons to tell it. That was kind of like the, the stuff they were thinking about. Sure. They also talk about things like hypnosis, Yoga. That all of these things are like cyborgian. Yes. Okay. Ideas that like you can extend the function and control of your body by doing these things and kind of like learning how to better harness your mind. They also talk about drugs in the paper and sort of continuous input of drugs. It was the 60s. It was the 60s, right. So this all kind of falls under this umbrella that is, you know, beyond just like, you know, pieces of machine in your hand. There's something that feels more true or accurate to say that like you are a cyborg because you have an elective radio broadcasting thing in your hand. Um, like what is the what is the sort of tension between medical tech, 
this kind of thing, and even like glasses. So I think that like people talk about like language as a technology, people talk about animals as technology, the horse and carriage was a technology, sure, yeah. all this thing, all these things are technology. So there's sort of the big broad definition of like what technology is in terms of like how people use it and what does it do. Um, I think in this particular case, it's interesting because I think because people come in with different ideas of what technology is, some people would say, yes, glasses are a technology that makes you a cyborg. Some people would say, yes, like all of the people out there who have pacemakers are cyborgs. Yeah. Other people would say like that doesn't feel right. Like that doesn't feel like the correct. It doesn't. Which way, I feel like right? is maybe you know like, like we have these posters around like Blade Runner or whatever. You know we yeah. when we think about cyborgs, we want to imagine this very complicated, not sort of daily it keeps you alive kind of thing. Right. It's a you know it's it's this very sort of almost fantastic marriage of biology and machine. You recently wrote a fusion piece mm -hmm. about body hackers and your your sort of main thesis statement was there is actually a, a long history of sort of the cyborgian but situated almost entirely in like the life of women. And I was wondering if you could sort of just take us through that that thesis a little bit, yeah. that idea as it relates to these these ideas about like what technology is. One of the definitions of technology that I've heard is technology is a thing that men do, right? And women have been doing things that have been controlling, if we're talking about cyborgs as controlling the body and sort of having these controls on what you're doing, birth control is probably a, the best example of something sure. like that, taking and you mentioned, a cycle. You mentioned um, like period tracking apps being yes. like, yep. Yeah, so so basically, I mean, women have been very aware of how fertility works for a very long time, longer than doctors most likely. And then when you look, you know, at the technology that gets developed, you know, Apple's health watch didn't have period tracking. You launch this huge quantified self project and you don't include the original quantified self thing. My argument is, you know, I have an IUD, which is this little device for people who aren't familiar. It's a, it's a little T-shaped device and it, there are two different kinds, but the one that I have um, slowly releases hormones mm -hmm. um, and basically like lets me control my fertility. And the ability to have a piece of technology that can do that yeah. is huge. And I would argue that it's cyborgian. I will say that from my perspective, like my gut reaction is, no. That is no. Yeah. Is that like glasses? I'm like, okay, sure. like sure, all right, I guess. Pacemaker, absolutely. Yeah. That has computer chips in it. But an IUD, I'm like, I don't know. Real yeah. like isn't that isn't that just medicine? What if the IUD had a little motor in it? Right? <laughs> like just just a thought experiment. What if it had a little motor in it that then released the progesterone or whatever? I would I would and, feel so different. Right? Like, and that is a weird thing. So I think now we're at a place where we can talk about this um, uh, pursuit of body hacking and like what it means to be a body hacker. Yeah, I think it's an open question within the body hacking community about who is part of it and who isn't. So I was recently down in Austin last year for a conference, which is actually where I got this uh, implant. It was the Body Hacking Con. It was the first one ever. Um, and so it was organized to kind of try to bring together a lot of these different worlds. So there's like the grinders we've kind of talked about who are implanting the stuff in their bodies. And I think those are people who, okay you normally, like most people would say like, yes, those are like body hackers. Negative, I am a meat popsicle. And so it was like this very big spectrum from like people who are implanting antenna into their head to be able to see color to people who are putting butter in their coffee. Yeah. And that all fell under the umbrella of body hacking. They specifically did not call it like cyborg con. They called right. it body hacking con. I think that there are some people who would really love for everybody to come together. And part of that is like a political move, right? Because if you lump grinders in with people who are doing meditation, it normalizes sort of that sure, fringe sure. edge. Like and this that's, thing that's sort of easy to understand yeah. if they can say that they are in league with this other thing that is maybe a little bit more challenging. Exactly. I think that they do want it to be more normalized. If only so that like doctors will be willing to do some of these surgeries or whatever it is. Yeah, that's the interesting thing of working out the semantics yeah. of all of this, which is you sort of have to work out what is at the center of the Venn diagram where it all overlaps. You know, when we call something a cyborg, we immediately go to this place of technology because of the word, you know, cyber. Yeah. Um, but that it, this all makes me think of um, Catherine Hale's uh, How We Became Posthuman in her book, and this idea of posthumanity yeah. is maybe like a more apt description of what this is, where it's, it's you know, it's trying to sort of figure out posthumanity both in the sense of like, what comes after whatever we think of humanity now, but then also kind of like what is the crisis that humanity is dealing with that can be addressed in all sorts of ways, not just through, you know, the cyber, whatever that means. But I think the thing that like Hales talks about and that like post-human I think focuses more on like the human bit. Yeah. 
And I think that's the part that is interesting to me a lot of the time because, and this is a little bit separate, but like when you talk to people about futurism and mm -hmm. like why is it that like futurism often seems to be the domain of like rich white dudes. And like, if you want to live forever, that's great, but that only really works if you have like compound interest and your life is really good right now. Yeah. Um, and I talked to some people and a lot of the women that I talked to who I would say are doing like futurist like work who don't identify as futurists are sort of like, I don't care about jetpacks. I don't care about, you know, bionics. I don't care about that stuff. I care about like, how is humanity gonna be better and like love each other better? And like sure. that feels like, when you talk about post-human, there's more emphasis on the like human and like what makes us human and how are we all connected yeah. than there is on the like, what hardware can we use to kind of like be better? But this is something that Donna Haraway, yes. who is here, we have her right here. She says that uh, the cyborg is a thing that kind of marries market technology and the personal, like the body as a political battleground. And so like maybe this really is a way to work against, you know, those controlling forces. Yeah, I think so. And Haraway, you know, she's really about the ways in which particularly women are kind of like inherently subversive, right? Just the fact that like the standard body is male and is white and is like quote unquote able-bodied. Um, and then like anybody that has anything different from that is already kind of subverting sort of what it is. And the things sure. that they're doing kind of make them cyborgs anyway. And there's also a, a good, I think like sort of sidecar, like our sort of ride along literature and disability studies too, because like they kind of play on a lot of Haraway's points saying like, you know, if the female body is considered, you know, somehow subverted or somehow sort of unnatural and already kind of that, then like obviously the disabled body is like even more so because it doesn't fit in the standard stereotypes of like what people expect you to be able to do and what a normal body looks like. So there's this interesting sort of, I think, push and pull between like, what is the normal body? How do you sort of enhance the normal body? And then, you know, whose baseline are we talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, what is an enhancement and what is like a medical necessity? And that's like a battle a lot of the time. By way of kind of conclusion, uh, and not to get too maybe mired in like figuring out what the solutions are, but I'm really curious what you are like excited about in the the future of this pursuit and line of thought. Like, what kinds of things get you really psyched um, about all of this? I think the thing that I'm most interested in is just like making this accessible to more people. Because I think in general, you know, the people who are coming up with like, what should we do? What kinds of things should we try? Are all kind of coming from a very similar worldview and are coming from a very similar background. So the fact that like more and more people, like more women are thinking about like getting into this space, um, that more you know people of color are thinking about getting into the space. I think that like that will sort of become interesting because, you know, they're gonna come in with different things that they wanna do. Going back to the question of like, do you wanna identify as a cyborg? Like women can identify as cyborgs, I would argue if they have an IUD. Not all of them want to do that, but I think like giving people choices of like, you you get to choose your identity, right? In the way that we've been talking about, like gender is a choice, right? Like a lot of these things are choices. So if we can open up more choices to people, even if they don't take them, that feels like a step in the right direction sure, to totally yeah. breaking down the question of like, do these boxes make sense? So it sounds like to a certain degree, like what you're saying is that, is that cyborg can be a kind of identity, that like it is a thing that you can identify as, and then that comes with the whole sort of expected host of questions and challenges and uh, categories and whatever else. I think I'm also really interested in you know, what, if people can have whatever they want, if people can make themselves into whatever they want, what would they do? Like, sure. what do they want? You know, I'm, I'm interested in that. So that's sort of what drew me to this world. I think that people in it, you know, they're really interested in pushing boundaries, I think in the same way that I'm interested in looking at people pushing boundaries. Right. Um, but I think they're also really interested in like, what is the way to be their best selves in sort of a way that I think a lot of people just in general are. And their version of this is to kind of like think about you know, how can I take my body and like upgrade it? But I think that really it comes down to like, how can I be the thing in my mind I imagine I could be? Sure, like for some of us, it's I will call my mom more or I'm gonna try to read 15 books this year. Yeah. But for this group of people, it is I will become so in tune with my body and possibly edit it in some way. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think we all have things we'd like to change about ourselves, right? Yeah. And this is just sort of the logical extension of that. Rose, thank you so much for joining us. This was. Super interesting. It was a huge pleasure to talk to you about all this stuff. Ah, oh, thanks for having me. This was so fun. Uh, so we'll put um, all of the links where people can find you uh, in the description. Uh, you can we'll put a link to Flash Forward and your Twitter and you know whatever else you want to give us. Sure. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank Let's you. Yay. Ugh. 
Let us know your thoughts about cyborgs and the cyborg identity in the comments below. I'm especially curious to hear what people have to say about the cyborg as a symbol of progress, but not just like technological progress, like what kinds of forward momentum does the cyborg symbolize beyond just, you know, putting computer chips into people. In this week's comment response, we talk about your thoughts regarding how the media does or does not influence your opinions. If you want to watch that one, you can click here or find a link in the doobly-doo. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweets of the week come from Spencer N. Wharton, who points us towards a predictive text generated synopsis for a Batman animated series episode that's as good as you expect it to be. And Solaru311, who points us towards a very interesting let's play of Dark Souls that I just, I don't want to ruin it for you. They shared it in response to um, a Let's Play of Dark Souls where every texture uh, was replaced with a photo of a crab. And I think just as a pair, these two work very well. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these cybernetic organisms, living tissue over metal endoskeleton.